Welcome to Be Ye Lifted, the online church of King of Kings Lutheran Church in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My name is Marie Duquette. I am the lead pastor at King of Kings and Be Ye Lifted. Uh, and today we're going to hear the story of David and Bathsheba and talk about sex. But first, let's take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy One, you are faithful even when we are not. You are able to reconcile the messes that we find ourselves in, often of our own creation. You are able to bring life out of death, and you choose to do so over and over again. Help us to work with your Holy Spirit, to bring restoration to this broken world. Amen. I'm a tiny mouse. And I'm a giraffe. We'll tell you Bible stories. Make you laugh. Let's see what we'll talk about. Giraffe and tiny mouse. Tiny mouse and giraffe. That's, that's me. me. 
Well, let's see. Cheese and carrots and a banana and some chips. Tiny Mouse Buddy, I'm glad you asked. Some is for me, and some is for you, and there is extra for your little friends, the hamster and the guinea pig, if they want to come with us. A couple of my giraffe friends might meet us at the park, but mostly they just eat leaves. But that picnic is really big. There's way more food in there than we can eat. Now what's that? A can of ravioli? Well, yes, I thought we could swing past our church and help stock up the free pantry food supply on our way to the park. I love it! Yes, please, let's do that. Will there be enough food to feed everyone who wants to come to the pantry? Probably not. Hmm. Of course, if we were Jesus, there would be plenty. Do you remember the story about Jesus and his friends feeding 5,000 people at one big picnic? No, what, TM? Maybe if other people also bring food for the pantry, there will be enough to feed 5,000 people, or even more than that. You are a smart little mousy, aren't you? And kind. Ah, shucks. Thanks. I'll go and ask the hamster and the guinea pig if they want to come. Did you pet carrots and apples? I certainly did. Also some cheese, because I think someone around here likes cheese. I like cheese! No kidding! Well then, let's go! Thanks for the picnic, Jarif! What did you pack for yourself? I packed some salad dressing to drizzle on my tree leaves.
Today's reading is from the second book of Samuel, chapter 11, beginning with the first verse. In the spring, when kings go off to war, David sent Joab along with his servants and all the Israelites, and they destroyed the Ammonites, attacking the city of Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his couch and was pacing back and forth on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone and inquired about the woman. The report came back. Isn't this Eliam's daughter Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers to take her. When she came to him, he had sex with her. She had been purifying herself after her monthly period. Then she returned home. The woman conceived and sent word to David. I'm pregnant, she said. Then David sent a message to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked about the welfare of Joab and the army and how the battle was going. Then David told Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. However, Uriah slept at the palace entrance with all his master's servants. He didn't go down to his own house. David was told, Uriah didn't go down to his own house. So David asked Uriah, haven't you just returned from a journey? Why don't you go home? The chest and Israel and Judah are all living in tents, Uriah told David, and my master Joab and my master's troops are camping in the open field. How could I go home and eat, drink, and have sex with my wife? I swear on your very life, I will not do that. Then David told Uriah, stay here one more day. Tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day. The next day, David called for him, and he ate and drank, and David got him drunk. In the evening, Uriah went out to sleep in the same place alongside his master's servants, but he did not go down to his own home. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. He wrote in the letter, Place Uriah at the front of the fiercest battle, and then pull back from him so that he will be struck down and die. Later in the story we read that when Uriah's wife heard that her husband Uriah was dead, she mourned for her husband. After the time of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her back to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. But what David had done was evil in the Lord's eyes. Leonard Cohen wrote the song Alleluia in 1984 during a low point of his career. It was the first song on side two of his albums called Various Positions. When he submitted it to Columbia Records, they didn't hear Alleluia as anything special. And in fact, they weren't interested in releasing the album. It was released in Europe that same year and in America the following year, but not by Columbia. When it was released, the song Alleluia did not get much attention. It wasn't until other famous artists, most notably Bob Dylan, John Cale, and Jeff Buckley covered it, that people began to listen up. 
Since then, Alleluia has been covered by nearly everyone, from Bono to Bon Jovi, not to mention church choirs and small groups around the world. To my dismay, many of the churches who have used it in worship completely changed Leonard Cohen's original lyrics from something beautiful, mystical, and haunting to a watered-down story about true love. Leonard Cohen wrote a total of 80 verses for Alleluia, painstakingly paring it down over time to the four verses in his final version. Alan Light dove deep into this story behind the song in his book, The Holy or the Broken, Leonard Cohen, Jeff Buckley, and the Unlikely Ascent of Alleluia. In it, he writes accurately that the word Alleluia has slightly different implications in the Old and New Testaments. In the Hebrew Bible, it is a compound word from Allelu, meaning to praise joyously, and Yah, a shortened form of the unspoken name of God. So in today's reading, this Alleluia would be an active imperative, that is an instruction to the listener or congregation, sing tribute to the Lord. In the Christian tradition, Alleluia is a word of praise rather than a direction to offer praise, which became the more colloquial use of the word as an expression of joy or relief. Hallelujah. It's a synonym, synonym for praise the Lord rather than a prompting to action. The most dramatic use of Alleluia in the New Testament is as the keynote of the song sung by the great multitude of angels in heaven in the book of Revelation, celebrating God's triumph over death and the devil at last. In a July 2011 service at St. Paul's Presbyterian Church in Prince Albert, the Reverend Dr. R.M.A. Sandy Scott delivered a sermon linking this song in today's reading. I'd like to read a passage from that sermon now. The story of David and Bathsheba is about the abuse of power in the name of lust, which leads to murder, intrigue, and brokenness. He recounted that until this point, David had been a brave and gifted leader, but that he now began to believe his own propaganda. He did what critics predicted. He began to take what he wanted because he could. Reverend Scott calls the choice of the word baffled to describe this David in the song Alleluia, an obvious understatement on Leonard Cohen's part. David is God's chosen one, the righteous king who would rule Israel as God's servant. The great King David becomes no more than a baffled king when he starts to live for himself. But even after the drama, the grasping, conniving, sinful King David is still greatest, Israel's greatest poet, warrior, and hope, Reverend Scott continued. There is so much brokenness in David's life, only God can redeem and reconcile this complicated personality. That is why the baffled and wounded David lifts up to God a painful alleluia. Following the David and Bathsheba reference, the sexuality of the lyrics is drawn further forward and reinforced in an image of torture and lust taken from the story of Samson and Delilah. Quote, she tied you to a kitchen chair, she broke your throne, she cut your hair. Before the lyrics resolve with a vision of sexual release, and from your lips she drew an alleluia. 
Both biblical heroes are brought down to earth and risk surrendering their authority because of the allure of forbidden love. Even for larger-than-life figures and leaders of nations, the greatest physical pleasure can lead to disaster if misused. And it is that last part of Reverend Scott's sermon that I want to dwell on in my conclusion. It would be impossible to count all the people, heroes and everyday citizens, who have risked surrendering their authority and their blessings because of the allure of forbidden love. Even for larger-than-life figures and leaders of nations, the greatest physical pleasure can lead to disaster. In fact, since this country was formed in 1776, 94 sitting members of our government have been involved in sex scandals, including at least 11 U.S. presidents. And so, perhaps the story of David, who considered himself above the law when he went to the roof during the hours when it was forbidden for men to be on the roof because it was during that time that women bathed. Perhaps this story is one about all of the agony that can come from abuse of power when it is used to gratify one's lust. In David's case, a rape which led to a pregnancy, which led to the murder of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, which led to David crying out to God in repentance and regret when the child he conceived with Bathsheba died shortly after birth. And it is also a story about the reconciliation that God brings about between people who see no way forward once their alleluias have been broken by their own weakness, their own sinfulness, their own greed. God, who created men and women to be in relationship with one another, who blessed them with the gift of sexuality and all that goes with it, made a way for David and Bathsheba to move beyond death into a new life that included their next son, Solomon, who lived and went on to be a great leader and build the temple in Jerusalem. Historically, we have not talked about sex and sexual relationships enough in the church. And now at a time when we are intentionally learning more about the complexity of gender and sex and sexuality and sexual expression, we must talk more honestly and openly about these topics and what the Bible has to say, both about humanity's tendencies and God's intent to restore all people and all of creation to God's self. Because David's story cannot be reduced to this one story of poor judgment, just as our stories cannot be reduced to the worst thing we have ever done. And the church's story cannot be reduced to only the damage it has done to LGBTQIA people, as well as to people who have been preyed upon by those who hold position in the church who saw their power as somehow giving them permission to do the unthinkable. The church as a whole has a lot of reconciling to do. It can be daunting to consider. But it is work that is not optional if we want to be faithful. If we want to be faithful in the way God calls us to be. While humans seem determined to cross boundaries and disregard God's commandments to satisfy their own greed, their own lust, it is God's desire to see those who have sinned by their misuse of sex 
have their relationships restored, their sense of wholeness restored, their very lives resurrected. It may not make sense to us, who often see revenge as the first or the only option. And yet God, over and over and over again, chooses to take the broken and make them whole.
Do you remember when, as if by sheer miracle, another met your need with kindness? Can you recall a time when you were able to offer what you had to ease another suffering or to welcome their delight? What relief, what peace, what a sense of this is why we're here. In this spirit of miraculous interdependence, we bring our offerings to each other and God. Thank you for your generous offerings, which sustain the work to which we are called, feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, and caring for those in our beloved community, both face-to-face -face and online. To join us in this work, please go to kingofkingslutheran.org and click on Ways to Give, or go to Fed Up Ministries and click on Give. God help us. Our healers need a break. May those of us who can sub in for the weary. May those of us who need rest be supported and encouraged. Radical and rested one, bless our shared resources to the rejuvenation of our healers and to the creation of new ways that honor our sacred rest. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Holy Spirit. Amen.